welcome everyone again. My name is Richard Kearney, and this year I'm serving as the director of the Gandhi Forum for Peace and Justice. Um, the forum, just to tell you a little bit about our mission, one of the things we try to do is we seek to promote dialogue and education on some of the greatest challenges that confront the human race in the 21st century. Uh, resolving conflicts, eliminating war, and advancing the cause of social justice. We have not previously done a uh, program on the topic that we are addressing today, but uh, as the provost indicated, it's very timely, and it's consistent with the mission of the forum. So I would like to, um, very happy to introduce our, our speaker today, our distinguished speaker, who we are happy to have with us, um, Martha Livingston is the professor and chair of the public health department at the old Westbury campus of the State University of New York. She is the vice chair of the board of directors of the New York Metro chapter of Physicians for a National Health Program. She's a member of the editorial board of the Journal of Public Health Policy. She's a member of the steering committee of the labor campaign for single payer health care and she's a serious New York Mets fan, <laughs> as I am. And I think it's very appropriate because if you want to toughen yourself up for a long-term <laughs> struggle, <laughs> there are a few things that can help you as much. The Dr. Livingston lived and studied for several years in the province of Saskatchewan, Canada, and has researched and written on the Canadian healthcare system. She's advocated and spoken incessantly about national healthcare reforms since 1992 and is the editor with Mary E. O'Brien of a book titled 10 Excellent Reasons for National Health Care, uh, which will soon be part of the Chang Library's collection. So oh, further gosh, ado, I would have brought one had I known. <laughs> well, we'll, we'll get you to autograph it after we purchase it. It's old. So uh, I give you uh, Martha Livingston. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much. Can you see me? Can you hear me? Is this OK? So the only thing that isn't is I, you know, they can put a man on the moon, but they can't film without shining lights directly into your eyes that make you go, I'll talk, I'll talk, which is appropriate because that's what I'm here to do. Um, so the title that I gave this talk is Healthcare for All, a Social Justice Issue and a Window on the Social Wage. And I gave it that title because I don't just want to launch into a discussion about how we are alone among the rich nations in the world in failing to provide health care to all our people. I promise you I'll get there in a few minutes, and that is the focus of our talk. Are there any public health students or faculty in the room? Okay, great. So you guys know that health care is but a piece of the issue, that even had we all wonderful access to health care, that would not actually make us enormously healthier than we are uh, today because there's so much more that goes into how people get healthy, stay sick, stay healthy, get sick, and so forth. So first we want to talk about what do we mean by social justice? What does that actually mean? Do we mean that people actually need to have those things. When I talk about the social determinants of health, I say, what do people need to lead a decent, healthy, and productive life? And I think that those are some of the pieces of what we talk about when we talk about social justice. And that would encompass, without really getting deeply into it, having security, um, which means not being in a war, not being attacked by other people for who we are, and so forth and so on. Um, and then what we want to do also is a little bit talk about what do we mean by a social contract? Anybody ever hear that expression, the social contract? What do we mean by a social contract? That means the society, I'm expected to behave in a certain way in society, on the other hand, society, whatever exactly that means, is expected to behave a certain way to me. Okay, what does that all mean? This is getting all, 
It's all very vague and airy-fairy so far, right? So then we get to the term that I used in my talk title, the social wage. Well, we all know what wages are. How many people here have either now or have ever had a job where you were paid a wage? Pretty much everybody in the room, I would imagine. What's a social wage? The wage you get paid when you do a job is the wage that you and your employer have arrived at. It has nothing to do with social. A social wage actually has a very specific kind of definition, and that is it's the right to have enough of an income or resources to lead a decent, healthy, productive life. It's determined on the basis of the narrow definition says citizenship, but really residency, rather than on the basis of employment. So this is, unfortunately, in 2017, a reasonably radical idea. Just because you're here and you're a person, you deserve the right to have whatever it is we need, just as a minimum, to lead a decent life. You need food, clothing, shelter, education, opportunity to develop your own set of skills and knowledge so that you can be a productive member of society. That's what we mean by the social wage. And in a lot of other rich capitalist countries, people have a much better idea what we're talking about when we say social wage than we have. So one piece of the social wage, for example, for us, would be free public education. Everybody, by virtue of living in the United States, has the right to a free public education until the end of secondary school, right? In many other rich capitalist countries, education includes the right to higher education without getting tens of thousands of dollars in debt. That's another piece of the social wage. Why? Because that's society's investment in the next generation. And you know what? The, the polar opposite of that, people ever go to school board meetings or town meetings, you actually hear, so I think this is a technical term, these crusty old farts who are sitting in the room <laughs> saying, why should I pay for public schooling? I don't have any kids in school. And you just want to say to them, you know, idiot, you're going to be in the emergency room one day, and aren't you going to want whoever's there treating you to have had access to an education? I mean, what sort of absolute chaos do we devolve into when we stop thinking about our fellow, na our neighbors, our community members, as people who need these basic pieces, building blocks, in order to lead a decent, healthy, productive life. So then we talk about, for example, what do workers get when we go to the job? We get a salary. Do we get other benefits of working? What is the obligation of the employer to us? Well, here's the nice thing about being a little bit older, and I'm not going to go in my day it was all better because, oh boy, it really wasn't. And I can name you 27 ways in which it wasn't. But corporations, until the 80s, had, believe it or not, even while they were ripping off their workers and paying them too little and all that stuff, they had a basic sense of being a member of a community. So we provide jobs in the community, and we provide maybe some other benefits to our workers, but we have an obligation to the community. You would not hear 30 years ago or so corporations just picking up and going somewhere else because they could find a cheaper, well, maybe 40, whatever. They've, of course, they've always been after cheaper labor, but they wouldn't just pick up and go. They wouldn't just fire that. You know how you hear 
Verizon or whoever has just fired 2,000 workers because their earnings were down this quarter. Stuff like that, throwing just massive numbers of workers into complete chaos so that their bottom line can be as good as they want it to be for their shareholders. This is not actually how it used to be. And as I say, I'm not taking out the violin and wishing for the good old days because the good old days weren't so good. For example, where I grew up in downtown Brooklyn, there was a really cool high school for smart kids that was literally two blocks from my house and I couldn't go there. Why was that? I wondered about this a couple years ago. How come I didn't go to Brooklyn Tech? Oh yeah, girls couldn't go there. And you're like, wow, really? Yeah. People who are still alive <laughs> had that experience of, you know, boys only kind of stuff. And the sport that I love more than many other things in the world, I adore baseball. It's still a boys only game at the professional level. So anyway, moving right along, my point is to frame what we're going to be talking about today in a broader framework of what the society is, what it might be able to do for us, what we might be able to do for it. It really started, I think, this, this iteration of everybody is in it for yourself started under Ronald Reagan. Government can't do anything right. The private sector can't do anything wrong. Personal responsibility, all of that kind of language. It's not that those concepts didn't exist. Of course, they always did. But the frame in which we operate now, you just have to be aware that you have that frame in your head because you live in the United States, and that is the frame. And you're expected to feel ashamed if you need to ask for help. So you might be working full time and minimum wage, ah, part of this social contract, right? I should be able to work full time, make a minimum wage, that's a living wage. If I can't, I'm supposed to feel shame that I have to go to a food bank or get what SNAP, what used to be called food stamps, to help feed my family, or Section 8 to help me buy housing on the private market or rent housing on the private market. I'm expected to feel ashamed about that. And that, I think, is really a shame on our society. That Walmart, for example, actually has staff whose job it is, ready for this, to instruct their employees how to apply for Medicaid, for food stamps, for housing assistance. Why? Flip the script a little bit in your mind, and what you're seeing is the taxpayer is actually helping to pay Walmart's wages. You should be able to work at Walmart or Mickey D's or wherever and support yourself and your family. And if you can't and you rely on public programs, that's part of that social contract, to help you get by, whose responsibility is that? Whose fault is that? Well, a lot of low-wage workers internalize that, don't they? I'm a loser because I can't get by without standing on a line, asking for help. It's wrong, it's undignified, and yet that is how we treat many millions of Americans. This is part of what we talk about when we talk about the social determinants of health, which include living in decent housing, in a safe community, where there's access to healthy food, I submit to you that very few of us even have any more the slightest idea what healthy food is because what we eat is not necessarily that. Even as we drove up that avenue on the way to campus, I saw a number of places that people could go and get a bite 
um, but very few of them looked like the bite you would get would be very good for you. Um, and we have this concept, have people heard this, even non-public health students, the concept of a food desert? How many people don't know what that means? Raise your hand. Cool. I'm proud of you for doing that. So a food desert, you know what a desert is. A food desert is a place that's a desert for healthy food. So if I live in a community where there's all this fast food and mom and pop stores and so forth, and I could get liquor, right, and I could get cigarettes, but I can't get broccoli, <laughs> okay, there's no supermarkets, there's no affordable healthy options in my neighborhood. That's considered a food desert. And we're starting to do a lot more work in public health about that because what people eat depends largely on what's affordable and available and accessible to them. So in New York City, I'll often see people in snazzier neighborhoods getting on the subway to go back to their relatively working class neighborhood with shopping bags full of food because food is more available and cheaper in rich neighborhoods than it is in poor neighborhoods. So that's a food desert. So we do a lot of victim blaming in this country. And that is the same idea of internalizing the idea that I can't look after my family on the money that I make. Why are you eating this stuff that you know isn't healthy? Well, first of all, do I know it isn't healthy? I don't know if you remember, there was a lawsuit in the Bronx about 10 years ago, a dad whose kids he was a single dad, he gave his kids each a dollar, and they were to stop at Mickey D's on the way home from school, that was what was available, and pick up a bite on the way home and then wait in their apartment with the door locked until he got home. And those two kids became morbidly obese because they were eating Mickey D's every day. If you've seen the film, or you might want to check out this film, Super Size Me, same idea. If you eat a diet of Mickey D's, you will become morbidly obese and sick. There it is. That food. And he went to court and he said, I thought that McDonald's served food that would be healthy for my children. And everybody laughed their heads off. What an idiot. How did he not, and how wasn't he in on the news that this stuff is anything but healthy? Well, I submit to you what idiots the society is for thinking that it's up to every individual to be personally knowledgeable about what's contained in the food that we buy. That's why we now have all of these signs posted about this many and this many calories and stuff. So if you get your pumpkin spice latte at Starbucks and it has half the calories you want to eat today, you might really want to think twice about it. No joke, when people saw that that was like 550 calories, they're like, whoa, I'm going to have a slice of chocolate cake if I'm going to do 500 calories, right? Um, so seriously, the point is let's refocus not on individual and personal responsibility, that hateful <coughs> mantra that says that you're responsible for your own health status, but let's recalibrate and look back out at the larger forces that can make us healthy or can make us sick, depending on what's available to us and what information is available to us and what responsibilities those corporations have that are feeding us or selling us other stuff that is important for our health. So that is the broad context into which we put the conversation about health care justice. So the ability to be healthy, to stay healthy, is the social determinants of health. It's why, for example, wealthy Americans live 10 to 15 years longer than less wealthy Americans. Why white Americans live six years longer than African Americans. That is the social determinants of health. So we look at social class, we look at poverty, 
we look at racism, we look at gender inequities of various kinds, we look at neighborhoods, we look at workplaces, we look at what food is available, and we look at the social networks that connect us, and I don't mean the network in your phone. I mean the network of who's sitting next to you, who's studying with you, and so forth. The kinds of social connectedness that we feel or don't feel because we are actually human beings innately social. And you may be the biggest loner in the world, but you still rely on other human beings for much of what keeps you alive. You know, I have students who say, oh, I take care of myself. I don't need anybody else. So I'll just go, really? So um, where'd you get your clothes? I bought them in a store. Oh, you didn't make them yourself? So I guess you are relying on somebody else's labor to have put together a shirt and a pair of pants, because look, you're not naked, just for an example. Um, we are, unlike the big cats, for example, solitary species. They have babies together, they raise the babies, and then you're on your own. Bye, time to make some more babies and hang out, you know, lolling about until I get hungry, in which case I go run for a while, catch an elk, snork up the elk, and then go loll about in the sun some more, because I'm a big cat and I'm a predator. And that's not who we are. That's not how humans are. We are innately social. Wherever you look, in all kinds of societies, all over the world, forever. We have vastly different social arrangements, but we have social arrangements. So we need each other. There it is. Okay. <sighs> Having said all of that, now it's on to the actual focus of my talk today, and that's health care and health care justice. And Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, of all the forms of inequality, injustice in health care is the most shocking and inhumane. And I think that we all kind of in our hearts, we feel that when people are sick and need care, that should be a right. That's a kind of sense of morals that most of us have, most of us. Not all Americans actually share that sense of the moral right to health care. What I'm going to talk about, I hate when people tell you what they're going to talk about. Why don't I just talk about it instead? So the way that I see it is that there's three major arguments for all Americans, and by Americans I mean everybody resident in the United States. There are three reasons why we should all have access to care when we need it. The first is the economic argument, which I'm about to make. I'm going to throw some numbers on the board. This is a, um, just a heads up in case you want to take out a notebook. There's the public health argument. That is to say, if not everybody has access to care, then none of us is actually as healthy as we need to be. Why? Because then we're being exposed to things we wouldn't be exposed to if everybody had access to care. If I'm sitting on the New York City subway and the guy next to me is coughing, I would really like to know that he doesn't have TB, which back in the day when I first started teaching public health, who had, nobody had TB. We thought of TB as one of those diseases of the past. Well, it came back to us. It came back to us alongside the HIV and AIDS epidemic because when people's immune systems are compromised, if we're not all protected by, say, for example, vaccinations, then we're all potentially at risk. And so we have TB again in the United States. Okay, so there's the economic argument, there's the public health argument, but I think me, me and Dr. King and a few others of us agree that the moral argument is really the crux of the argument. Come on, how hard could this be? We're human beings, we are all going to need health care. Honestly, why shouldn't we have health care when we need it? And here's the reason. 
The reason is that in the United States, contrary to what we all believe in our hearts, healthcare is not treated as a right. It's not treated as a public good the way public education is, say for example, or police and fire, or all the other, think about the public services that we all enjoy. We don't take them too seriously. I kind of got lost on the way here, in part because there were some road closures, because you know why? Roads were being fixed. Oh, your tax dollars at work. There's a pothole, we're fixing it for you, because we all kick, we're all in this together. We all kick in, and then when stuff needs fixing, we fix it. We don't expect Martha to go out and fix the pothole on Casino Boulevard on her way to work, because, you know, we have a social system whereby the pothole fixers do that, and Martha can drive over and, you know, go to her job as a teacher, right? Oh, garbage, by the way, also, it, it's really nice that somebody has a garbage truck and comes by and picks it up and recycling and so forth. And so just thinking about the things that we may take for granted, but they cost money. So we provide them as part of the taxes that we pay. Well, as, um, as Richard Kearney said in his introduction, I spent a couple of years in Canada. I did some of my graduate work there. And I actually lived in the province you know, they have provinces, not states. I lived in the province where their system, which they call Medicare, originated. And every time I go back and visit my friends in Saskatchewan, which is that province, or in Ontario, Toronto, or in Quebec, Montreal, or in British Columbia, I have friends in Vancouver and Victoria, every time I go, back to visit, and they know what I do, they know that I speak about this issue, I get the pity look. So here's the pity look, it goes like this. What part of this don't you people understand? And I'm like, really, come on, honestly, I get it, I get it. But we have a really hard time in this country understanding that like all those other services, Healthcare should be one of those. It should be paid for. Oh, we actually have such a program, but in order to be in it, you have to either have turned 65 or be permanently disabled. We call that system the same thing the Canadians call their system, Medicare. We've got it. We just don't all have it. Everybody in this room is paying for it on the hope that you will live long enough to be able to enjoy health care security once you hit age 65. That was a compromise, by the way, back in 1965, along with the, the rest of the great society. We were hoping to get health care for all then, but actually there were efforts before that in 1948, Harry Truman did did some work trying to get health care for all in the United States. Didn't work. Then along came the very right-wing 1950s where people talked about health care for all as socialized medicine. You wouldn't want that. And literally, there's an album, no joke, there's an album, you remember vinyl? That Ronald Reagan cut when he was still an actor where he gives this speech against socialized medicine, which is going to be communism taking over the US if we were to have a Medicare system. And so it sort of was on the back burner until the 60s and Johnson and the Great Society. And they tried at that point to get Medicare for all, but there was a compromise solution because the American Medical Association was against it. So we got Medicare for seniors and we got the state federal joint programs called Medicaid, um, which covered some, not all, of people who were too poor to be able to afford to get care on their own. Well, come on folks, it's 50 years later. I've personally been working on this 25 years. It's time. It's past time. 
So we've had a few more rounds of work on this. We had the Clintons, Bill Clinton in the White House in the 90s, trying to come up with a plan, but it wasn't a Medicare for all plan. Then we had the Affordable Care Act, which many of us still enjoy to this day, notwithstanding the best efforts on the part of the Republicans, and we'll get there in a minute. And that plan has some very good features in it, and it includes more people than were included before, so more Americans have the ability to get health care when they need it because of the Affordable Care Act. But what it did mainly, it did two, two main things. I mean, you guys know, probably some of you, about the part where if you're under 26, you can stay on your parents' insurance plan without having, when my kid was in college, pre-ACA, every semester he would have to certify that, you know, we would have to send in a thing saying he was a full-time student for him still to become. The minute he graduated, that was it, goodbye well before age 26. So that's definitely a good thing. Another definite good thing is pre-existing conditions can't be used against you to deny you health care coverage. Why would you even think that would be an issue? Well, because if I'm a for-profit health care company, I'm not in business to provide health care. I'm in business to make a profit. And if you're sick, I'm going to lose money on you, so why on earth would I want to insure a sick person? What a wacky idea that a health insurance company would insure sick people. No, no, no. That's not our mission. Our mission is to our stockholders, not to our customers. And in fact, health insurance companies, this is, I love this term. They, it's kind of Alice through the looking glass. They talk about the money that they actually have to spend providing or paying for your health care as the medical loss ratio. That's the loss. So for every dollar you pay in for your premium, however much I actually had to spend on giving you health care, on not giving you, but paying so you could go to the doctor, that's a loss to me, of course. But it's kind of, isn't it kind of topsy-turvy? So I read an article a couple of years ago in the Wall Street Journal that says so-and-so, the CEO of whatever, Aetna Cigna, United, whatever company, has been the CEO for the last two years. When he first came in, the medical loss ratio was 90%. But he has been so successful that the medical loss ratio is down to 75%. In other words, that company got to keep 25 cents out of every one of our dollars instead of only 10 cents. What a success story. How crazy is that? Do you see how crazy that is? We are the only one of the rich industrialized countries that allows a for-profit industry to stand between our doctors and other healthcare professionals and us as patients and tell us what kind of care we can and can't get based not on a medical decision between us and our doctors, but based on an insurance company's algorithm about how much money they, can, they want or don't want to spend on you. So now, just for a minute, I want to throw a couple of numbers on the board while I'm speaking. Excuse my back. So we are the only wealthy country in the world that fails to provide health care to all of our people. But paradoxically, and because of this for-profit system, we spend far more than anybody else on the planet. So here are some numbers from, that are the most recent numbers from last year. So we spent 3.2 trillion, okay, on healthcare last year. Do you know how many zeros that is? 
Okay, so let's do it, right? Like 3.2, well, three minutes, so that would be what? That would be 3.2 million, right? That would be billion. Let's keep going. <laughs> okay, get that, that much money is what we spent on healthcare last year. About just under $10,000 per capita per person in the United States or greater than 17% of our gross domestic product. That's ludicrous. That's close to a fifth of our economy that we're spending in health care. So it's greater than a sixth of the whole economy. How crazy is that? You're thinking, well, I don't know how crazy that is because what do all those other countries spend? Well, the answer is the most expensive other countries spend around 11% of their gross domestic product. So those would be, say, Germany, Switzerland, Canada. And if you look at a, at a table of all those other countries, all of whom have health care for all of their people, from Japan to Australia to Sweden, all over the place and all over the world. They range anywhere from about 8 to 11% of GDP. And for that amount of money, they cover all their people. Everybody has access to care. Everybody has health care security. Nobody but us ever has to worry about getting sick. Nobody but us ever has to think, OMG. If, so what happens, right? We get our health care if we're privately insured, mostly through our employer. Well, God forbid you get sick enough, you lose your job, then you lose your health insurance. And then you start paying retail. Because I know when I get these explanation of benefits forms in the mail from my insurer, every single office visit generates nine pages that I get in the mail. Talk about wasteful spending that does nothing for anybody. And it will say, you saw Dr. Stokes last month. He billed us $237. We paid him $112. Why? Because they negotiate a deep discount, and you have to pay a copay of 20 bucks. But if I lose my job, then I have to start paying retail. Because now I'm uninsured, the uninsured get that bill, they're liable for the whole $237. Okay, got the picture? These folks, all of them. If you want, by the way, there's a nice video called Sick Around the World. It's a PBS video. You can watch it online. It's a little under an hour. And it looks at Germany, Switzerland, the UK, Japan, and Taiwan. Taiwan being the most recent of the universal health care systems, which learned a lot from Canada and from a lot of other countries. But as they say in the film, no, 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 we didn't want to model our system on yours. Because for a lot less per capita than we spend, they cover all their people for everything. Okay, so this is crazy. And on the other, so we're spending all of this money. Before the Affordable Care Act, we had about 50 million Americans who were always uninsured. With the Medicaid expansion, as well as the exchange programs where you could go and get some assistance in buying private insurance, that has plummeted. So it's probably only around these days something like 30 million. 
and always in our language, this is not, you know, sort of vague, it sounds vague, but always means we looked over the last two years and you didn't have insurance over the last two years. We can't exactly estimate, estimate, but tens of millions more are sometimes uninsured. And why is that? because your insurance is tied to employment, you switch jobs, you lose coverage, you have a waiting period on your new job for your new coverage, right? So you've got a gap in there over the last two years. Of, the, of whatever that number is, more than half are uninsured for six months or so in that two-year period. But here's a number we really can't actually put a number on and that is people who are, I like to say, unsure. We are insecurely insured. And what I mean is exactly that. That most of us don't have a catastrophic illness most of the time. Most of us don't have a major accident most of the time. Some of us think that we are brilliantly insured until that moment at which we come down with a condition. And that's when we find out that on page 87 of our contract that we signed 33 years ago when we started working at this company, there it is, it says right there, that thing Martha has, it's not covered. So we're insecure. We don't actually, any of us know that when we need health care, it will be there for us, even if we think we're well insured. We just don't know. Why? Because the insurance companies that insure us are not in it to insure us. They're in it to make sure that they make profits for their shareholders. It's that simple. So then you, you see this stuff, you see these numbers, and you go, okay, where's the money going? The answer is, if we got rid of the for-profit insurance model, we would save, no joke, greater than 500 billion a year and that huge amount of money would cover all Americans for everything we could possibly need. When I say all Americans, I mean all residents of the United States of America. Because frankly, when I break my leg and I go in the ER, I don't want somebody to ask me for my green card. I want them to fix my leg. So we get the for-profit out of the system, we save so much money, and we're spending so much more than everybody else that we could have everything we could possibly need in terms of health care, and we would be secure in having it, and we would live happily ever after, except for all the other social issues that we're addressing. I'm very serious about that. This is the solution to our problem. You won't hear it a whole lot on the mainstream media, though you do hear it more now than you would have in years past. So what happened? In 09, we got the Affordable Care Act. It didn't actually build on the public Medicare system. It built mostly on the private for-profit insurance system, but it also provided lots of people access to Medicaid, with the Medicaid expansion, and that was all a good thing. And also in it, it said, and this applies to my state of New York, not in New Jersey right now, it said that states could experiment with doing what they wanted to ensure their people as long as the experimental program at least met the minimum standard that the Affordable Care Act met. So no discrimination about pre-existing conditions and so forth and so on. The state of New York 
is actually well on our way. We're quite close, we think, within a year or two to passing legislation that will provide this kind of Medicare for all for all of our people in New York State. But you're not in New York State. So we need to talk about what has happened to health care since January 21st. It's been so interesting. It's like sociologically interesting, politically interesting, certainly, psychologically very interesting. There's one good thing that can be said for the current political situation, and that is that a lot of Americans are on fire. So the minute this administration came in, they said, we're going to break the contract on the Affordable Care Act. We promised, we ran on repeal and replace maybe-ish, right? Um, and, and that's what we're going to do. That's our first thing. We're going to get rid of the Affordable Care Act. Well, it was fascinating what happened at that point, wasn't it? Because those folks went back to their districts during their recess, and we're talking about deep red Republican states with people going to town hall meetings in Kentucky, in West Virginia, in Colorado, in just all kinds of places all over the country, screaming at the people they had elected, at the Republicans they had elected, saying, you can't do this. How dare you do this? One guy I'll never forget just pointing his finger and going, you're trying to kill my wife. His wife is in the middle of chemotherapy that she's getting because they're on a plan that they bought through the Affordable Care Act. If you blow that system up, my wife can't afford this treatment. She will die. You're trying to kill my wife. Well, it was very dramatic, and it's fascinating to me how quickly things move at times of crisis. It's the only good thing about this last nine, ten months is what has been going on in terms of people resisting, fighting back, taking on a lot of stuff in addition to the health care fight. But in terms of the health care fight, so ever since 2003, Congressman John Conyers, I don't know how many people are familiar with him, he's longest, now longest serving congressperson in the US Congress. He's been there since, well, close to 50 years. And um, he has been the lead sponsor of H.R. 676, which is, as my button says, the improved Medicare for all bill. Improved, why? Because Medicare, while our seniors enjoy health care security that the rest of us don't, has holes and gaps in it and people have to buy supplemental coverage to take care of those gaps and we don't want that. We want everybody in the United States to be able to get the care they need without co-pays, without having to buy private coverage, just it should be free when you need it. So write that down, HR 676, and here's how smart Congressman Conyers is. I, I think this is so cool. You know, there's a, Congre a new Congress every two years. His bill got number 676 in 2003. And every two years, when he introduces it, he makes sure it gets number 676. So I can wear a button that I had from 2005 that says support HR 676, and it's still a relevant button. It's very smart. He's a very smart guy. It's a wonderful bill. My organization, Physicians for National Health Program, has actually worked closely with the congressman over the years to craft that legislation. He, with our help and others' help, have actually improved that legislation over the years so that long-term care needs to be part of it. It's more of an issue than it used to be in the past, and so forth and so on. We now have a companion bill in the Senate that was recently introduced by none other than that guy, Senator Bernie Sanders, 
uh, and that's S1804. Don't know if that number will stick, but it's the one we have for now. Now here's the interesting thing about politics. People are like, oh, you know, it'll never happen. The bad guys are too powerful. We're too weak. Congress people will tell you, oh, I'm all for it. And if it ever comes up for a vote, you can count on my vote. Well, don't really try and spend that one at the grocery store because that's not really worth the paper it wasn't printed on. Um, the fact of the matter is, is that Conyers' bill now, this year, has 120 co-sponsors. That's twice the number of co-sponsors he ever had in the past 14 years that he's been introducing this bill. Bernie Sanders introduced this legislation in previous Congresses with zero co-sponsors. The minute he introduced it this time, it suddenly got 16 co-sponsors in the Senate, including Cory Booker, not including Bob Menendez, but who knows what's going to happen there. I don't, I mean, it's interesting. It's like my usual pitch would be, you should put pressure on Senator Menendez and get him on that bill. And I still think that's a good idea, but we know he's got some other things on his mind right now. And we wonder if he'll still be there, but hey, it can't hurt. Give him a call. Hi, how come Cory Booker is on S1804 and you're not? Answer will be, you know, because I've been busy worrying about some other things. But seriously, I know this sounds cornball. It sounds Mr. Smith goes to Washington. I know that's a reference none of you get. It was a wonderful movie from far beyond, far before you were born with Jimmy Stewart. You never heard of Jimmy Stewart either. It's a marvelous, it's also black and white. You don't watch black and white. But seriously, <laughs> seriously, it's a wonderful movie all about democracy in action. And you would enjoy it if you were to say, for example, Netflix it, which you can very easily. I happen to know. My point there about Mr. Smith goes to Washington was the power of the people is illustrated in that film. And the same thing that was illustrated in that film is something that we do all the time. Do you know that if you call your congressperson or your senator's office, if they get 10 calls a day on an issue, they're like, what's up with this? Because they know that 10 calls represents 100 constituents. Hi. I'm Senator Menendez's constituent, and I want to know why he's not on S1804. That works. Look up who your congressperson is. Hi, I see that Congressman whoever, whoever, has endorsed HR 676, and I'm just calling to say thank you, keep up the good work. We are paying attention because this issue is really important to us. This, this is called retail politics and it actually works. I had a congressperson who would never sign on to 676, but I was his BFF. Seriously, he was like, you know, the thing about if it ever happens, you can count on my vote. But literally, his office, they knew me well enough to know that they could call me up and say, Dr. Livingston, could you come in to a meeting that we're having today and talk about whatever, whatever. You know, and I would show up and they actually used me for balance when they had right-wing nuts coming in to yell at them about stuff, so I would be the voice of sweet reason. It was, the point is, you can actually develop such relationships. So there's inside politics, there's outside politics. I'm a great believer in a thousand people on the street with signs, on die-ins. Did you see the really courageous disabled folks? in the halls of Congress recently? Did anybody see that? How many people saw that? About two, three. So go Google that, disabled people getting arrested in Congress. And what you see is people in wheelchairs literally getting lifted out of their chairs and arrested for 
Medicare for all. So this is what it only makes common sense to go for. I think there's only two reasons we don't have it yet. One is power. That is to say, the folks who are in charge of a sixth of the economy like to keep it that way, and they want to keep all the profit in their pockets that they can. And they have strong lobbying groups on their side. That's one piece. And the other piece is imagination. Oh, Martha, it sounds like such a great idea, but I just don't believe it can get done. So here's what I want to say to you. Anybody remember 1960? Not very many of us in this room. But it wasn't that long ago that four college students sat down at a lunch counter in Greensboro, North Carolina, and changed history forever. Go look it up if you don't know what I'm talking about. Everybody knows who Rosa Parks was. But can you name the four students who sat at the lunch counter in 1960? You know what I'm talking about? And you know what their folks all said to them? What are you, crazy? You can't change segregation. All that's going to happen is you're going to get your head busted open, you're going to go to jail, and they're going to throw you out of college. So don't even think about it. They changed history. So the bad guys have all the money and they have a lot of power. We don't have a lot of money, but we do collectively have the power. We've got people power, and this is what we need to use really to grow this movement and to get this going. And anybody tells you, oh, and I'll never pass this Congress, you just say, yeah, I know, but I'm not planning to be dead in two years. So let's build this movement here now and take it one step further and keep building it until this is absolutely unstoppable. I think we're actually almost there because I think that this system is unsustainable, is going to collapse under its own weight. I also think it's morally always been unsustainable because people are getting sicker and dying because they can't get access to care in the richest country in the world with the most expensive healthcare system in the world. So I invite your questions and comments and I also invite you to join us in this movement, I have a sign-up sheet for the PNHP New York Metro chapter. I will point out that you are in the New York Metro region and also that we have a New Jersey chapter and I'm happy to network you guys with them. So I'm going to pass this around and let's have Q&A. Questions, comments, complaints? Go. Your turn. Yes, ma'am. Um, you have um, a, a really great idea, um, and, and I'm not saying it's your idea. I think a lot of us would like to buy into it. How do you account for the role of um, the insurance companies in this, and how are we going to, um, because it's, there are, it's a very complex system, mm -hmm. and insurance company is only one of the big players. Mm -hmm. Pharmacies are really big players. Physicians are big players. They're coming around, I think. Um, I'm not sure who all the other people are. Just talk to me about what you think those roles are and how we can change them. So, I do want to take on the idea that the issue itself is complex, because I really don't think it's complicated. And I know that you can complexify it. I know you can talk about value-based payment systems and all this kind of language that health economists and health policy people can throw at you to make you feel, oh my goodness, I really don't understand the issue. They must be right. I must be naive to think this is workable in the United States. No, everybody in this room knows plenty about this issue. Here's what you know. We're spending a whole lot more than everybody else. We're not getting our money's worth. We understand that. 
And, and besides, it's, an abs it's absolutely criminal that anybody should be sick or die from lack of health care. Now, as to who are the players on the other side, for sure the health insurance industry is against this. For sure big pharma is against this because pharmaceutical prices are regulated in all those other countries where they keep costs down. That's one of the ways they keep costs down. We have no such control mechanism here. So of course they're against it. Doctors are not against it. A majority of doctors, with the exception of some of the surgical specialties, are actually in favor of this kind of Medicare for all system, which you will sometimes hear called single payer. So if you hear that term, that's a wonky term that I don't like a whole lot because sometimes people, no joke, as I've spoken over the years, people have said single payer, single payer. I'm married, does that mean I can't be in it? I mean, it sounds dumb, but it's not dumb. It's a wonky term. Single payer simply means the government pays the bill instead of the private insurance industry. So I, don't th I think that there are forces arrayed against this that are rich and powerful. But I don't think the majority of us would be against it if we really understood the issues. So what are some of the things that get thrown at us when we come out and make our case? They'll say, for example, taxes. Who wants to pay more taxes? Remember I was talking about that frame of Ronald Reagan from back in 1980? Taxes are the enemy. They're not really. That's how we pay for social programs, is we all pitch in. And taxes are actually a progressive way to pay, right? Because if I pay a health care premium, the president of my college pays the same premium that I do. And I pay the same premium that the cleaner pays, who makes considerably less even than I make. That's regressive. The poor you are, the more of your income you're paying for your premium. But taxes are much fairer. So they'll throw the tax thing at you. They will throw race at you. And you don't even notice that it's happening. But they will say, do you really want to be in a system with those people? So they conjure up a vision of nice white middle class Americans waiting on lines to get care with everybody else, those people, from some like kind of welfare office, which is completely not what we're talking, we're not talking about changing how we get our care. I'm still gonna go to Dr. Stokes, because I've been seeing Dr. Me and Dr. Stokes are tight. He even knows how much of a Mets fan I am, because he's that much of a Mets fan. That's what you call an ongoing relationship with your primary care provider, and that's what helps keep people healthy. So that he knows if Martha's blood pressure is X, that's the right number, and if it's X plus something else, that's the wrong number, because he knows Martha, right? So they'll throw taxes at us, They'll throw the idea that somehow those of us who have good relationships with healthcare providers or systems, that relationship will be disrupted. It will not be. And the other word that they'll throw at us that we love is choice. Because we're Americans. We love choice. We don't have choice in our healthcare now. We have whatever healthcare our employer buys and includes us in. And if they get a cheaper deal the next year with another insurance company with a whole different list of doctors, then I might have to give up Dr. Stokes and go to somebody who doesn't know me from a hole in the ground and that I don't have a 20-year history with. We have no choice at all. In Canada, you know who you can see in Canada if you want to see a doctor? You can see Canada. Literally, the entire nation is in the plan. There are a few doctors in Canada who have opted out. That is to say, they prefer to see only people who come in with sacks full of dollars. Fine, they can't be in Canada the way their system works. You can't be in and out. 
You know how many of those doctors who are outside the system, last time I checked a couple years ago in Canada, 106 in all of Canada. In other words, it's a vastly popular system that all Canadians and virtually all Canadian healthcare providers participate in. So I'm just giving you a little bit of an inoculation with words like taxes, with words like you won't be able to see the doctors you want to see, choice. Those are the main ways that they chip away at our enthusiasm for demanding this kind of health care plan. Yes? Um, I also hear uh, an argument against the system as um, quality of care goes down mm -hmm. when you go to this national um, right. health system. And then I read um, books that show the poorest classes in Great Britain have better health than Americans. Hello. Uh, and then I hear uh -huh. um, that, oh yes, the wife of the Prince of Saudi Arabia comes to America to get health care. Mm -hmm. Maybe, well, she can afford it. So can you talk about that argument? I, I would be happy to talk about that argument. So for example, imagine, I always love the argument that somehow if everybody's included, it's worse quality care. Why, your doctor is gonna get worse? First of all, I mean, it, it does not compute. It's not logical, Captain. Okay, that's thing one. Thing two is, are you kidding me? You think the Swiss are putting up with second class health care? The Swiss? I mean, that's the most capitalist country on the planet. They're hardly, so, I mean, the Swiss, you know, the Germans, they're gonna tolerate second class care. Nobody in the rich industrialized world has poor quality health care unless they chose the wrong doctor, which they are free to do. I remember a, a young woman actually kind of complaining to me in Canada. She had three kids. She said her oldest had this really serious problem and dang, they could not find a doctor who knew what was wrong with him. It took them five doctors till they found the guy who saw that their son, their teenage son, had a brain tumor. Well, isn't it nice they had the option of seeing all the doctors they could see till they found the one that, fixed, that figured out the problem and then he got fixed. And she said that they had family in the States and they had been thinking about moving to the States, but after the experience with their son, they were like, no way could we leave Canada. Um, the other issue about, you know, the Saudi sheikhs coming to Sloan Kettering to treat their cancer. Sure they do, but guess what else they do? They go to France, they go to Germany, they go to Canada, they go to the UK. We just don't know it because we have this we're number one attitude. We don't even know what doctors there are in France. There are some treatments we would rather have in France than here. Knowing what I know about healthcare in Canada, I know that if God forbid I had a seriously ill child, there is no better hospital in the world than Toronto's Hospital for Sick Children, period. The end, hands down. The other argument you hear is the waiting line argument. That is by and large, and about 99% a fabrication. So nobody, nobody waits for urgent care in Canada. Emergency care, forget about it. My friend Peter had unstable angina. He was being seen in his doctor's office. The doctor said, no. You can't go home and pack a suitcase. You're going to the hospital. I will call your wife and she will bring stuff to the hospital. Did it cost him anything? It did not. Like that. So the argument that the care isn't going to, somehow we are holding on by our fingernails to the care that we have because ooh, 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 we somehow, we're special enough we're middle class enough, we're educated enough that we're getting care that we would no longer get under a national health care program is absolutely, actually kind of offensively wrong. Yes? Um, I kind of 
with the two point questions because I'm not sure if you uh, thought about this, but I guess what what motivating factor do you believe would help to contribute to this idea of healthcare for all? Uh, I would I more how it's going to be Uh huh. So just that, and this other, I guess, notion of uh, you can talk about it philosophically speaking, uh, John Wall, Dale, ignorance. The gentleman that you mentioned in the beginning, uh, he said, "Oh, uh, I want to pay for another person." Now, mm -hmm. I guess at that, for that individual, he probably doesn't know that. I guess that information, what the implications are for. Uh, having health care for all, but there's also this other thing that kind of comes beneath that. that it's a probably a more subtle argument of uh, this idea of expanding the moral circle, just mm -hmm. understanding that you know that person you you I guess approach it in a rational way. You, you, you say, all right, yeah, yeah, that person you don't know if that person that is going to help you. You actually pay for. I guess at that moment, that gets uh, a little bit interesting, but also complicated because if we live in a system where we don't know who we're going to be or who we're going to interact with, mm -hmm. so how would you really inform that individual like this, uh, by ration, rational, rational alone, or more sense of feelings as emotions? And, so I think once we have a system that includes everybody, that individual sees that everybody's included, and that individual is probably right now enjoying, say, Medicare, right? And they will say, well, I paid in all my life because I worked hard all my life, so I deserve this. But the fact of the matter is, we're all paying in all the time. We all deserve this. If we don't pay in, it's because we don't have a job. If we don't have a job, how did that come to be? And then we can get into that whole sort of more global understanding of what the society is. What I can say to you is even very conservative people in those other countries know that they are the beneficiaries of a health care system that takes good care of them. So rather than try and focus on that individual now, because that's a person who's going to you know, be sort of chest thumping and you know, I took care of my blah, 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 all that stuff, I would rather talk to that person once we have Medicare for all and say, now you see, it's really working out for everybody because they'll see. I had, I guess, another question to tie it up more economically. I guess. Uh, so these insurance companies that are, uh, I guess, making a uh, larger profit than they should. Uh, I'm gonna, you heard of the case of uh, that one, the gentleman. Oh, yeah, Martin Shkreli, the guy we all love to hate. Now, uh, it's a very interesting ar argument if you would deposit that. He's going to use that money because he's going to make Better Not Shkreli. He's never said that. He's never made that argument. He has, he has said, I can raise the price of this medication 5,000% because I can and I feel like it. That's a system out of control. If a private greedy individual can make a determination that's actually going to put the public's health at risk, and oh, by the way, we wind up paying for that because there are so many members of the public whose health care we're already paying for that they got to make a personal decision because they could. That's a system that's broken. That's a system that has no controls built into it. He couldn't function that way in Canada because the health care system in Canada 
negotiates with pharmaceutical companies and tells them how much they're going to get. And they have a negotiation. They go back and forth on that stuff. The argument I think that you're trying to make about all of that profit subsidizes innovation actually turns out not to be true. There's innovation in Swiss drug companies, in French drug, it's all over the world. There's in those drug companies, there's innovation. There's actually not that much innovation compared to all the new products that they put out that didn't require very much innovation. But the fact is they are making in the United States more profit than any other industry in the US. They make close to 20% profit margin after research and development because they can because nobody's minding the store. When the Republicans came in in 2003 and put in the Medicare Part D, the prescription coverage piece of Medicare, they negotiated it such that they wrote it because it was a Republican bill, they wrote it such that Medicare was prohibited from negotiating drug prices with pharmaceutical companies. And the year after they passed that bill, that law, Congressman Billy Tozen of Texas, who was the chief sponsor of that bill, went to work as the CEO of the trade organization, which is called Big Pharma, at a salary then in 2004 of $2 million a year. So it's pretty transparent. Yeah. I just want to take note of the fact that we are uh, coming up to a class transition yeah. time, and I know mm. that that's why and some people have to leave, uh, although you know, certainly we can continue the conversation. But for those, for the sake of those who have to leave, I just want to uh, thank everybody for coming to this poll program. Thank you. I want to thank Dr. Livingston for being a, uh, an excellent uh, speaker for this poll program. I just want to thank uh, the sponsors for this for this program, this semester, the Departments of Public Health, Nursing, Political Science, College of Education, the Chiang Library, and the Office of the